Welcome to Unwired Learning. In this video, we're going to talk about electrical amplification. Our goals for this video are going to be to define and calculate basic amplifier parameters, such as gain, power draw, losses, and amplifier efficiency. And finally, at the end of the video, we're going to take a look at the four different amplifier types. These are the voltage amplifier, the current amplifier, the transconductance amplifier, and the transresistance amplifier. We can see over here the basic symbol for a circuit amplifier. In this case, we have some sort of signal coming in and a signal coming out that is a larger, more amplified version of the signal coming in. Because this is the case, what we say that this amplifier does is causes gain in the signal, or it has signal gain. We denote gain with the letter A, and we can have all types of different gain. We can have voltage gain, A sub V. We can have current gain, A sub I, and we can have power gain, A sub P. Before we get into some of the specifics of electrical amplification, I want to make a note about notational conventions. In this case, our signals that we have coming into the amplifier and coming out of the amplifier might have both a time varying or AC component as well as some sort of DC offset value. Therefore, it's important for us to know how we can distinguish based on our conventions what kind of signal we're talking about. When we talk about a mixed signal, we use the convention of a lowercase letter and a capital subscript. An example might be a lowercase voltage V sub capital D. When we say a mixed signal, that means it's comprised of both a DC offset and a time varying AC component. The DC value we would denote as capital V, capital subscript D. And the time varying AC component we would denote with lowercase letters. So in this case, lowercase v, lowercase subscript D. For the sake of clarity, let's review each of these again. The lowercase v, capital D, is the mixed signal. The capital V, capital subscript D, is the DC offset. And the lowercase v, lowercase subscript D, is the AC component. Now when we think about electrical amplification, we might think of a lot of common applications, such as audio amplifiers, amplifying a sensor signal, having power gain in a circuit. Maybe this would be for applications like broadcast antennas, where we broadcast radio and television signals, or wireless using cellular or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or any of the other wireless standards. All of these require amplification of a signal. In each of these applications, one of the most important parts of our amplifier is that it reproduces the input signal accurately as its output. This is what we call linear amplification. In our example here of linear amplification, let's take a look at an amplifier that is increasing the voltage signal. Over here on the left of the amplifier, we have a voltage input. And on the right of the amplifier, we have our voltage output. And this amplifier has a voltage gain, A sub V. Now we can write the gain that is in this amplifier as a ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage. So we would say A sub V equals V out over VI. If we think about that, that means that the units for this particular gain, A sub V, is in units of volts per volt. However, when we want to compare different types of gain, oftentimes we want to use a commonality between them. We want to use some sort of unit that allows us to make this comparison. In this case, the most convenient unit for gain is given as decibels. In the case of voltage gain, we can convert this unit of volts per volt into decibels by doing 20 log of the absolute value of A sub V, and that's in units of decibels. I want to make a note here that when I write log, I mean log base 10. Over here on the right, you can also see that I have a graph, or I have some axes here in which I'm going to graph something. I have on the vertical axis, I have the voltage output, and on the horizontal axis, I have the voltage input. Being that I have a volts and volts in both the axis, this graph is what we call a voltage transfer curve. The idea here is that it gives us a sense of what the input signal will look like when it's transferred to the output signal. Because the amplifier that we're looking for is going to be linear, it makes sense to us 
that the transfer curve in this case is actually a line. In this particular example, I'm drawing the line as having a positive slope from the origin. It ought to make sense that the slope of this particular line is the voltage gain A sub V. If this particular line or this curve was not exactly a line, say it had some sort of curving in its shape, then we would say that in those areas our signal would distort. So what we're looking for when we look at a voltage transfer curve of a real circuit is something that has as close as possible to a linear response from voltage in to voltage out. Now of course in this example we used voltage as our signal, but as mentioned previously we can have current gain and we can have power gain. Current gain would be given as the output current divided by the input current. And of course that's in units of amps per amp. And like before, we would want to convert this to decibels whenever possible to make proper comparisons. Like the voltage gain, the equation is 20 log of the absolute value of the current gain. For power gain, we recognize that power is actually the product of voltage and current. And therefore, power gain is given as V out times I out divided by V in times I in. And this would have units of watts per watt. Since we have a product here, our conversion to decibels is going to be a little bit different. Also, since we have a product here, we don't have to worry about any negative signs and we don't have to think about taking the absolute value. It turns out that the equation for converting power gain to decibels is 10 log A sub P. It should make sense that this is 10 because if we think about the fact that there's a product, we can kind of think about that as being a square, and therefore that would come down and reduce this value to 10. I wanna take a quick moment here to talk about what happens if our transfer curve line here is not an increasing slope, but rather a decreasing slope in the negative direction. Well, in that case, the slope of that line is still our gain, and all that that means is that we have an inversion of the signal. It doesn't mean that we have lower gain, rather it just means that the signal is 180 degrees phase shifted from the incoming signal. For most applications, such as audio applications, there is no issue with this. We can't hear the difference between a signal that is shifted by zero degrees and a signal that's shifted by 180 degrees. For the sake of a little clarity about this voltage transfer curve, let me erase this value of A sub V and show you how exactly I mean when I say that the voltage input is transferred to the output and has gain. We can see here that our voltage input is plotted on the horizontal axis. So let's imagine that we have a signal that comes in and has a range from this voltage to this voltage. And we'll draw that signal as a triangular wave. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to extrapolate these lines, the peak points, up to the curve. And then I'm gonna draw them horizontally. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replicate my output signal between these two horizontal lines. Just to be clear, what I'm showing here on the horizontal axis, the VN, is our input voltage signal. And what I'm showing here as coming out of the vertical axis but horizontal to you is our output signal. And you can see how that produces gain. When it comes to the electrical signal amplifier, just considering the voltage transfer curve as we did before is not the end of the story. In fact, what we have done is we've actually simplified the idea of the amplifier and we've abstracted away a lot of the detail. I'm not gonna go into the fullest detail yet, but one of the things that we need to consider is that of the power supplies that are supplying the extra energy in order to amplify the input signal to the output signal. In most cases, there are two power supplies. There's a positive rail and a negative rail. There are now several questions that we should consider when it comes to the fact that we have an input signal, an output signal, and we have power supplies all providing power. For one, we should look at the power balance between all of these inputs and outputs. Let's start with these power supplies. We're gonna have power coming in from here and from here, and we should consider what each of those are. So the power in this case is going to be the voltage V plus times the current that is in that rail. And of course, for the negative supply, it'll be V minus times the current that is in that rail. Therefore, we can write a total power that is coming from the power supplies. We'll call this power of the DC rails, PDC. 
and PDC equals V plus times that current plus V minus times that current. Those currents might not be the same, so we're gonna denote them a little bit differently. Not only do we have power coming in from the power rails, we also have power coming in from the input. We'll denote that as P sub I. We will also have some power to the output, and if we have a load on that output, then we'll call that P sub L. In this case, we can see that we have P, D, C, and P, I as our input powers, and so far we only have considered the power to the load. Since we have two inputs and one output, we can equate these two because we must conserve power. We can say that P, D, C plus P, I equals P, load. And if our amplifier was perfect at transferring the input signal to the output signal and providing gain, then this would be the final equation. However, as is the case in most situations, it's not perfect. It's not 100% efficient from input to output, and therefore there is some power dissipated in this amplifier. We will denote that as P underscore dissipated. And that last equation is our power balance equation in our amplifier. One of the things that we might want to consider is what is our efficiency from converting the input voltage to our output voltage, or in a more generic case, our input signal to our output signal. In that case, what we would consider is our power efficiency. We have power at the load and power at the input. We also have our power DC. Oftentimes, our power DC is much, much larger than PI. So therefore, we can write that our efficiency, eta, is defined as power to the load divided by power at the DC. And if we want to express that in percentage, we would multiply that by 100. These power equations are not the full story. One of the things we have to consider is what limitations the amplifier has due to the fact that we have a power rail at the plus and a power rail at the minus. In order to best illustrate the limitations, I'm going to once again return to the voltage transfer curve, and we're gonna modify that plot based on the fact that we have these power supplies. In this case, we're gonna draw our line that we had before, but we're gonna find that we have a maximum input capability that is just a little bit below our voltage input rails. We'll call these two points on the curve L plus and this one L minus. What this means is, is that we have a limitation on the size of our input signal before our output signal starts to get cut off. It might get a little messy, but let me illustrate this idea. Let's first draw a signal that is appropriately sized for this particular amplifier. In this case, we can see that we have appropriate gain. However, what if we had a signal coming in that was a little bit larger? What would happen to the output now? Our signal wants to have a larger gain than what is possible, and therefore some of it gets cut off. We might also say that it gets clipped. Now let's take a quick look at an example where we look at the power balance of an amplifier. As a reminder, we have written our equations that we solved for previously over here on the left. In our example, we are given that we have a linear amplifier that has plus or minus 10 volt supplies that draw 9.5 milliamps each. We have a voltage input of 1 volt peak that has a 0.1 milliamp draw. We have our voltage output is 9 volts peak, and that voltage output is going to a 1 kilo ohm load. We're asked to find all the gain values of power, current, and voltage gains, and our different powers, the DC power, the dissipated power, and the load power, as well as our circuit efficiency. In this case, let's start with our gains. This is simple enough. We're given that our output voltage is 9 volts peak and our input is 1 volts peak. Therefore, we can directly write that AV equals 9 volts over 1 volt, which gives us 9 volts per volt. Converting to decibels, we get that 20 log of 9 equals 19.1 decibels. In our givens, we were given the input current as 0.1 milliamps. We were not, however, given the output current but we can calculate output current by recognizing that that 9 volts peak is going to the load. In this case then, we can say that our output current peak is 9 volts divided by 1 kilo ohm, which is 9 milliamps. Now we can write our current gain as 9 milliamps divided by 0.1 milliamps, which gives us 90 amps per amp. Converting to decibels, we find that that is equal to 39.1 decibels. Now that we have our values for voltage gain and current gain, we can find power gain. It turns out that power gain is just the multiplication of voltage gain and current gain. So therefore, we can write that A sub P equals 9 volts per volt times 90 amps per amp, which equals 810 watts per watt. Converting 810 watts per watt to decibels, we get 29.1 decibels. These three values of voltage gain, current gain, 
and power gain give us our three gain values. Now we can move on to finding each of our power values in this circuit. Let's start with the DC power supplies. We were given that the DC power supplies are at 10 volts plus and minus, and they draw 9.5 amps each. Therefore, we can say that PDC equals 10 volts times 9.5 milliamps times 2, which gives us 190 milliwatts. For our input power, we have a 1 volt peak input drawing 0.1 milliamps of current, but these are time varying or sinusoidal values. Each one will have a square root of 2 to come up with the root mean squared, and therefore we can write that P input equals 1 volt times 0.1 milliamps divided by the square root of 2 squared, or just divided by 2. This gives us 0.05 milliwatts. The power to our load, we have a 9 volt peak output at 9 milliamps, and just like before, these are sinusoidal. Therefore, we divide by 2 again, leaving us with 40.5 milliwatts. Looking over here at our power balance equation, we can rearrange this to find our power dissipated. We have our power DC plus our power N minus our power to the load is equal to our power dissipated. In this case, we have 190 milliwatts plus 0.05 milliwatts minus 40.5 milliwatts. And that gives us a total power dissipated of 149.55 milliwatts. With that information, we can now calculate our circuit efficiency. Our power to our load is 40.5 milliwatts, and our total power is 190.05 milliwatts. Dividing those two, we get 21.31% efficiency. Now that we've discussed the basics of signal amplification, as well as calculated a few things like gain of the circuit and the power dissipation and the efficiency, we can move on to understanding what's inside that little triangle that we use to symbolize an amplifier. And we will start to develop amplifier circuit models. As mentioned previously, there are four amplifier circuit models that we want to consider. The voltage, current, transresistance, and transconductance amplifiers. Let's begin with the voltage amplifier. When we think about an amplifier as taking an input voltage and translating it to an output voltage with some gain AV, what we are essentially describing is the operation of a dependent voltage source. Therefore, it's not too difficult to understand that we have an equivalent circuit model for a voltage amplifier that consists of an input resistance, our dependent source, AV times VI, and an output resistance. On the left side of this, we have our input voltage. On the right, we have our output voltage. In order to maintain consistency, one of the things that we're going to do is look at this gain right here, and we might recognize that we're going to lose a little bit of that gain through this resistance, and therefore, we should not consider this as AV. Rather, we should consider it the gain when we have an open circuit here at the output. We're going to then denote that as AVO. The circuit model for a current amplifier is very similar, except in this case our dependent source is not a voltage source, but rather a current source. Therefore we have our input resistance, we have our current source, our dependent one, we have our output resistance, but this time our output resistance is drawn in parallel. The reason this output resistance is drawn in parallel can be understood in many different ways. I think the best way to understand this is to look at the fact that we must have equivalence between all of the different amplifier types. Therefore, if we consider what is the equivalent of a voltage source and a series resistance, well, that happens to be a current and a parallel resistance. We can prove this using Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuits. You may be noticing a pattern here. What we have is we have a voltage-controlled voltage source and a current-controlled current source, but we have two other kinds of dependent sources. We have a current-controlled voltage source as well as a voltage-controlled current source, and that's why we have two other kinds of amplifier models, the transresistance and the transconductance models. I'll go ahead and draw those now, and we'll do a little explaining after. Now that we have our two other amplifier circuit models, let's take a closer look at the ideas here. Again, this is now a current-controlled voltage source, and over here in the transconductance we have a voltage-controlled current source. One of the things you might be wondering is these two values in front of our current. Of course, this is related to our gain values. 
In this case, R is called a transresistance, hence the name a transresistance amplifier. But where does that R come from? It's a simple enough idea. We have a voltage source, and we know through Ohm's law that V equals IR. Therefore, since we're trying to produce a voltage from a current, we must have some sort of resistance to do so. Similarly, down here in the transconductance amplifier, we have a voltage input and a current at its output, and if we rearranged Ohm's law, then we get a 1 over a resistance. Well, a 1 over a resistance is known as a conductance, and that's why in this amplifier our gain value is called a transconductance value that we denote as G sub M. Much like before, there's a few other things to note. If we have a voltage source, then we have a series resistance, and if we have a current source, we have a parallel resistance. One of the other things we might want to look at is what values of RI and RO would be most ideal for each of these four different kinds of amplifiers. Let's start with the voltage amplifier. In this case, we want to have as much voltage appear across this resistor as possible because it's what is depending on the output voltage. Therefore, I think it's easy to see that this input resistance is best if it's very, very large. In fact, ideally, infinity. In the case of the output, resistance, we want as much of that voltage to transfer through this resistor as possible. Ideally, this would be a short, or have zero resistance. For the current amplifier, the situation is the opposite. We want as much current as possible, which leads to an input resistance that would ideally be zero. And since we want as much of this current as possible going to the load and not through this resistance, we want this resistor to be as large as possible, ideally infinity. For the transresistance amplifier, we take a few of the ideas from the voltage and current, but we have to look at the current for the input, which was ideally zero for the input resistance, and we have to look at the out value from our voltage amplifier to understand what's best for the output resistance. In this case, both the input and output resistances are ideally zero. Finally, we have our transconductance amplifier. In this case, we can also combine the ideas that we learned from the voltage and current amplifiers. Since we have a voltage here, we want as large a resistance as possible at the input, ideally infinity. And in the case of the output resistance, we also want that current to go to the load and not through this resistor, therefore this resistor should ideally be infinity. And now that we have a little preview of what's inside that little triangle that we call a signal amplifier, that concludes this video of Unwired Learning.